Our speaker today is Dr. Eric G. Dinglasan. Dr. Dinglasan is a BS Biology graduate of uh, Batangas State University, and he took his MS in Plant Pathology, minor in Biochemistry at UPLB. He obtained his Doctor of Philosophy in Agricultural Science from the University of Queensland in Australia uh, in 2018. And after getting his uh, PhD, he became a postdoctoral associate at uh, Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, during the first quarter of 2019. He came back to work for the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation of the University of Queensland as a, po as a postdoctoral uh, research fellow and now a full-time research fellow. His uh, research interests include uh, the following, uh, integrating quantitative genetics, plant breeding, plant pathology, uh, molecular biology and biotechnology, and applications of computational biology to solve complex traits for the improvement of economically important agricultural crops. So everybody, let's all give a big warm virtual welcome to Dr. Dinglasa. Sir Eric, take the floor, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good I'll afternoon, sir. start sharing my screen. All right. So can anyone see the screen now, clearly? Yes, it's clear, sir. All right. Um, first of all, thanks, Sir Flor, for that introduction. And again, I would like to thank um, UPLB National Museum of History for um, inviting me here through Dr. Jen Yem. Um, it's really a great pleasure to share my experience on some of the works that I have been involved in um, when Dr. Jen or Ati Jen asked me to give a talk on bi biodiversity. Um, the first thing that came into my mind is its importance to breeding for genetic persistence because my background is on pathology and plant breeding. So I think it's just fitting to talk about um, crop genetic improvements with focus on disease resistance, especially highlighting the role of gene banks um, as sources for um, these novel resistance factors that are not present in our modern um, germplasm. Um, so this is the University of Queensland at St. Lucia in the beautiful sunshine um, state in Queensland. Um, this especially actually I'm connected at um, Coffee. This is a research institute at UQ supported by the Queensland government. And this has four main research um, themes represented by different centers. Um, but before I begin my talk, I would just like to give a special mention to my um, bosses, Dr. Kai Bosfels, Professor Ben Hayes, and Dr. Lee Hiki. Um, all right, so to begin with, when we talk about plant diseases, one of the overarching goal is to develop a sustainable disease management. Because from um, what we learn, the disease is a result of successful interactions of these three players the virulent pathogen, the susceptible host, and of course, the conducive environment. And each of these players is affected by both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. And as a result, it's not just simple interaction. There's a lot of complex interaction among them. And any management that we do can affect on the outcome of the disease. Um, in terms of control, if you look at this illustration, so these circles, um, they represent the different control measures, so chemical, cultural, or biological, and genetic, whereby the size of the circle is the proportion being 100% effective. So the bigger the circle, the more effective they are. And as you can see, genetic resistance has the highest proportion, meaning they are more effective compared to the other, um, compared to the other control measures. Um, so then when we talk about breeding for genetic resistance, we have to consider the type of resistance we are dealing with because they act differently. And obviously they, has, um, they have different implications affecting the genetic diversity in our crops, especially when we know that the host pathogen interactions are also controlled genetically. 
So this um, um, type of resistance, we can just call them for simplicity, um, qualitative or quantitative resistance. Um, when we talk about their genetics, we refer to qualitative resistance as major gene or those with, ha uh, with large effects or single or monogenic gene compared to quantitative resistance where they only have uh, minor genes or those with cumulative effects and they are called polygenic, so many genes. In cereal crops like wheat, barley, and sorghum, um, they are called seedling or adult plant resistance because their effectivity is expressed according to their um, growth stage. Um, also, it is important to um, remember that the disease outcome depends on the pathogen lifestyle. When I say lifestyle, meaning if they are biotropes or those um, microorganisms that live in the host or those necrotropes that essentially kill the host. And because the resistance um, response um, um, can either be dominant or recessive, depending on the um, interaction of this pathogen. And historically, from, from in, in the past, the use of genetic resistance has mainly focused on the qualitative resistance because um, they are easy to manipulate. And although they are very effective, this has a long-term drawbacks, especially um, putting constant pressure to the pathogen, so allowing them to constantly mutate or evolve that's if you've heard about the um, boom and bust cycle where the resistance genes are overcome easily by the pathogen, thus the resistance are not being effective. So it looks like an arms race for um, resistance. And in breeding, because we constantly select for this single or a few genes, this can eventually lead to um, genetic homogeneity. So we always hear of loss of genetic diversity to these resistant factors. And for these reasons, nowadays, although very challenging, um, in addition to all qualitative resistance, breeders or a lot of breeding programs are now incorporating quantitative type of resistance because it can offer a more broad spectrum protection and is considered to be more effective in, in the long run or so it's, it's more durable. Um, so um, that being said, we can all agree that biodiversity matters. And history tells us why genetic diversity is very important. So for example, these are just two classic examples of the impact of plant disease. So um, for example, this potato blight caused by Phytophthora, this caused the infamous Irish famine in the 1800s. And this is largely attributed to widespread monoculture or use of this susceptible cultivar called Irish lumper. And in our modern times nowadays, you've heard about this um, Panama disease, which caused a global threat to um, Cavendish banana. So this is like history repeating itself because the pathogen is similar to the epidemic observed in the 1960s when it wiped out the Gromichel, which um, was the popular um, banana grown back then. But this time the pathogen has evolved and now um, threatening the Cavendish. So um, with that being said, um, we acknowledge the importance of genetic diversity and such a cliche that we humans are the victims of our own success because from the past or even early humans, when we learn agriculture, we have been domesticating crops by selecting what suits our purpose. So however, um, there are advantages, but still there are trade-offs. Um, so, for example, in the process of selection, we are compromising the genetic diversity. And it's in a sense, although we can see crop diversity, we are losing their genetic diversity in some way. Um, for example, um, just looking at the colors of this table, um, I just want you to focus on, the, on these um, three colors, red, green, and yellow. So this table shows the list of wheat cultivars grown in Queensland. And in the green colors, they tell you these cultivars are good in a particular trait. The yellow ones are the, the moderately good and the red ones are the bad ones. So although there are different cultivars out there, we can see that um, they are good in a particular trait. These same cultivars are also susceptible to diseases. So for example, in this um, um, boxed, um, Trade yellow spot, no varieties are resistant. 
So when we, um, when we are breeding for this disease, the question now is where can we find new sources of resistance when the resistant factors are not present in a modern cultivar? And also, you've heard this in several webinars for sure, that we are constantly um, facing these challenges, the growing population, changing climate, um, that's affecting the pro productivity, the inherent long breeding cycle, although genotyping cost has dramatically decreased, time is still the limiting factor. And of course, the um, genetic diversity of our crops. So then in the next slides, what I really would like to share with you are um, some of the strategies in breeding for resistance, especially highlighting the role of gene bank collections as sources of new resistance factors. Um, first, I would like to talk about introgression breeding. So this is basic, basically how we introduce new um, genes into our modern collection or modern germplasm. But how do we really utilize genetic factors from exotic sources and introduce them to our modern varieties? Um, and second, we, um, I'm going to talk about the integration of genetic algorithm or computational biology or this um, artificial intelligence intelligence to help us come up with a better or improved breeding strategy. So our um, approach stems from the challenge that I mentioned previously um, is based on this ultimate dream where we um, improve our um, um, crop genetics in the shortest possible time. And also just um, to give you um, disclaimer, I won't be talking or covering any, any breeding strategies involving genetic engineering or um, CRISPR or anything that involves biotech. So moving on. So this is um, just a snapshot of our approaches. So first is speed breeding. So this is um, optimized at UQ. Um, it's actually inspired by NASA. So when they grow plants in space station, in chambers fitted with continuous light and um, optimum temperatures. So um, as I was saying, this speed breeding technology is actually not new technology because NASA is already, um, they are using this one. What's new here though, is the application here on earth, meaning um, this technology has not been applied in plant breeding or any pre-breeding programs before. So that's why we call it speed breeding. But just um, to remind you, this is not a new technology. Some of you may probably already um, be using this one. Um, as you can see on the video, wheat, this is a wheat crop. Um, when grown under speed breeding conditions, they grow very, very fast compared to those grown under normal conditions. And you can actually grow for up to four to five generations per year compared to only two in normal glasshouse or one in the field. Um, on the other hand, we have this artificial intelligence algorithm. So this basically involves high power computing to build models in order to guide us, make decisions on how we select parents for our crossing strategies. Um, it is based on the framework of genomic selection, which I will elaborate more um, in the coming slides. But first, um, on the topic of the integration breeding, I would like to um, share with you what my supervisor would like to say, our success story, because we use this exotic germplasm and we um, um, identify novel sources of resistance and integrate this to modern cultivars. Um, for um, just a quick introduction for this topic, um, I will be talking about uh, a particular type of disease. This is called a yellow spot. So this is a um, foliar disease of wheat caused by the fungus Paranopora tutisiropentis. So um, they kill the host and they live on the dead tissue. So they are classified as necrotrophs. And they do that by producing toxins or effectors or their weapons. So these toxins interact with the host genes in an inverse gene for gene. So meaning resistance to toxins is recessive, not, not like the classical gene for gene where the resistance is um, dominant. And successful infection cause yellowing. 
So that's why it's called um, yellow, yellow spot disease. And as the disease progress, they coalesce and eventually the leaves die. And when infected at an early stage, the plants as a whole can die. And this is the reason why yellow spot has the highest yearly loss in Australia. And to make things worse, as you can see on this map on the Australian wheat belt, most Australian weeds are susceptible to the disease. So the question now, because the disease works in a similar manner to gene for gene, are there quantitative forms of resistance that we can use or alternative form of resistance? And if, if that's the case, then where can we find them? But what does it really mean for breeding? This means that in order to breed for disease resistance, it's not enough that we find those sources of resistance. We have to introduce these factors into our modern breeding tool. Um, so this is where the gene bank um, come to the rescue. So fantastic genes and where to find them. Um, so we all know gene banks are good sources of these untapped genes. Um, one of these, there's a lot, but one of these is the Vavilov collection. So it's named after Nikolai Vavilov, one of the most um, prominent Russian scientists who's famous, famous for his theory on the um, Crops Center for Diversity. Um, during his time, he traveled around the world to collect or preserve these crop species because he believed that these crops are um, those countries where these crops are found are the center of origin. And luckily, his collections are preserved and maintained in, in St. Saint Peter, Petersburg in Russia. Actually, now the collection holds around 330,000 accessions with approximately uh, around 2,000 species, um, including potato, wheat. Um, barley, etc. In, in, in wheat in particular, there's about 52,000. However, in our study, we only use like 300. It's just because mainly for, for the reason that these are the ones that are available in the Australian Grains Gene Bank collections. And these 300 accessions are mainly land races and few breeding lines and cultivars. And when we, rec when we talk about land race, um, as opposed to modern cultivars, land races have been um, less subjected to genetic drift and selection, meaning they display a broader genetic basis and they are mainly grown by farmers and only adapted to a particular region or environment where they are grown. So, however, when, when we use this exotic germplasm, there are some challenges, especially cross incompatibility, infertility, reduced combination, etc. And obviously the most important is the linkage drug where some of the um, undesirable, I would say, or some of those chromosome segments not favorable um, are also introduced to, to, to the breeding pool. So in this vacuum collection, we did extensive um, phenotyping so in addition to our experiments in here at UQ, we also collaborated with um, other scientists in Queensland, Western Australia, and in Russia. And to show you in one slide, the result of this, this is just a graphical summary. So the first um, three columns um, show the passport information. So this origin country, year of registration, and their biological status. And, and just to give you an impression of the diversity of the collection, the first column showing the country of origin, they were collected um, from about 30 countries from all over the world. And, and you can see most of the accessions are from India, Pakistan, and Russia. And if you follow the flow onto the next column, accessions were collected from 1920s to 1990s, where numerous accessions were um, collected in the 1930s, so even before the Green Revolution era. And in terms of their biological status, as I said earlier, a large proportion um, are mainly land races. And there are a few breeding lines. And if you notice those breeding lines and cultivars, they were added to the collection just after or during those period where breeding programs are um, just um, starting. In terms of their molecular diversity, when we looked when we use um, 
molecular markers or SNPs, we found that they are really, really diverse. And then basically they're clustered in two clusters. Um, so this, um, in this image, you can see the color coding of those lines. The land races are colored in blue, um, breeding lines in red, and the unknown ones, those without passport information are in green. And when we compare these accessions to the modern cultivars, such as those um, in Australia and in Simit, we found out that one, two, two, two main, two main um, messages here. First, the Australian and Simit lines, they are more genetically similar. So they're clustered together. Um, so this means that if we still use them for breeding program or any, any research, they will not provide broader diversity. On the other hand, the Vavilov collection, they are really diverse and this can um, be a good source for um, genetic diversity in any research or breeding program. So now that we know that the Vavilov collection is a potential reservoir for diversity, we then combined all the phenotypic and genotypic information to identify the genomic regions or UTL that are associated to resistance to yellow spot. And to make the long story short, we identified a QTL that's effective at adult plant stage. So um, that's what we're actually aiming for because this adult plant stage is a form of um, quantitative form of resistance. Um, not to overcomplicate things, but because this QTL contains two SNP markers, we then identified different haplogroups or just types of those um, combination of those two markers. And then we then identified which of the Vavid of accessions carry these haplogroups. Um, I just would like you to focus on the two groups here, the pink and then the gray colors on the map. So you can see accessions that um, carry the resistance QTLs those in pink are found in India and Pakistan. Um, those accessions that originate from Russia carry the susceptibility QTL, those in gray, but also some accessions carry the, the pink allele, the resistance allele. Um, so this is interesting because it relates to the host pathogen interactions that are present in those countries. For example, in India and Pakistan, there is only one race or type of the pathogen and this is similar to the type of the pathogen that's present here in Australia. So this means that the resistance or the QTL that we identified operates in the same manner. On the other hand, in, in, in Russia, there's actually eight type of races there. So that's the QTL that we identify here. Um, they behave differently and might not be effective when we use some of those Russian accessions. And as I mentioned earlier, because we are using this exotic germplasm as sources of new resistance, um, after the initial discovery studies, it is important to validate and confirm this QTL because they came from um, exotic sources. And so um, we then developed this experimental or biparental mapping population, whereby we use this land race parent and we identified, um, we crossed them the, those parents with the cultivar um, banks. So this is, the banks is the susceptible because when you, when you make a biparental population, those parents should be opposite on, 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 on regardless of what trait you're looking for. So the, the other one should be resistant and the other parent should be susceptible. So the land race actually um, originated in Pakistan and was registered in the Vavilov collection in the 1936. And this process was done under speed breeding conditions and they are all advanced for phenotypic screening and field testing, as you can see here in the video. One of the um, um, important outcomes here is that through this um, speed breeding, we're able to develop this mapping population in just a short time and validate the effectivity of this new QTL. Um, this is just to show you the effectivity of the uh, resistance where you can see there's clear segregation between resistance and susceptibility among those um, lines in the population. These images are both from the field and glass house. Um, and then 
we found this QTL, but then we, there's another question that we, we, were, we were asking because we know that it's from, from um, exotic sources. And as I mentioned earlier, when we use this exotic germplasm, there are some um, theotropic interaction or linkage drag that might occur. So when we combine both resistance and maturity trait, we found that both resistance and this maturity QTL are in the same chromosome. So this is a classic example or a perfect example of a potential linkage drag where if you select for resistance, you might also select for maturity. So to see if these um, regions or QTL are the same, we looked at their um, linkage disequilibrium. This just means that, um, as shown in the figure on the left on this triangle, tells you that if they are in linkage disequilibrium, those chromosome segments, for example, in pink, can be inherited together. If they are not, clustered or in pink, that means there's a chance that they can be recombined. So they might not be um, inherited um, together and thus they might be inherited as separate units. And if you look at the figure on the right, this shows their phenotypic response. And you can clearly see that resistance is only effective when plants reach the adult stage. So for example, here, wheat lines carrying the resistance allele in green while the lines carrying the susceptibility are in red. Um, the x-axis is just the disease score, nine being the susceptible and, and zero more resistant. While on the y-axis, just showing you the growth stage to maturity. SE is stem elongation. This is um, FL is flag leaves, visible booting stage and flowering time. So we can see there's a segregation pattern between the greens and the reds as they reach maturity, especially around, around booting and flowering time. So there's a segregation. So this means that resistance and maturity um, in this population are not the same. And this has implications for selecting for resistance, as I men mentioned earlier, because are you going to select for resistance or maturity or both? So then now we've identified the QTL. In terms of practical importance, how do we utilize these new genetic factors? So remember, previously we used an experimental population to study and validate um, this QTL. It is derived from a cross between the land race and the susceptible parent. Um, you can see on the diagram on the left. In integrating this to modern or adapted Australian cultivars, we use the most resistant inbred lines as the donor parent, and then cross this to different Australian cultivars as their current parents. So we perform this population development under speed breeding, um, and then perform this recurrent backcrossing strategy. So this is a traditional um, backcrossing strategy to develop near isogenic lines, meaning the, the backcrossing um, step is essentially making a line that is genetically pure or related to the modern um, cultivar, but you're only introducing this new genetic factor. So genetically, they are similar to the Australian cultivars. Um, at this stage, we are in the preparation for our field trials this year, and th this will be sent for um, genotyping and field testing. So in summary, using this um, Vavilov collection, we rapidly discover new sources of resistance to yellow spot that are not present in the current breeding pool. And using this step-by-step -step strategy from exploring these sources of resistance and identifying this genetic control, we show that introgression of this novel resistance factor can be done very rapidly. And in our case, through combining speed breeding technology, we are able to do this in five years compared to traditional seven to 10 years. And this is not um, only for yellow spot. So Babylon collection is also a great source of resistance to other wheat diseases, such as the different types of rust. Um, here are just some of my colleagues, past and present, who's involved on their um, different projects, utilizing Babylon um, as, as a source of genetic diversity for uh, leaf rust, stripe rust, 
using the traditional QTL mapping and then cloning and also introducing to different um, germplasm such as in Ethiopia. All right, so moving on to the next topic. So in this next few slides, I will be presenting some of the works that I am currently involved in. So this is more broad, so covering all aspects of genetic improvement aiming to increase genetic gain. So dealing with other complex traits from disease resistance, yield and end use quality. And in here we combine modern technologies or application in computational biology plus genomics and speed reading. But for the purpose of this seminar, I will only cover topics related to the use of germplasm for disease resistance. Um, I will also try my best to explain to you some um, principles behind this artificial intelligence that we are using. Um, as I mentioned earlier, breeding is a long process and thus that does not even take into account the pre-breeding part. And in this um, illustration, I would like to highlight three main things. First, it takes more than a decade to complete one cycle, one breeding cycle from crossing to product development. Second, notice the final shape. So breeding really is a numbers game. And lastly, the parent selection, which parents to use for the next cycle. So normally selection is done after extensive field testing. So meaning it could take for up to nine years still to select for the best performing parents and use that for the recurrent, um, you basically recycle the parents for the next crossing stage. And as you also noticed from the previous topic, I was generally referring to only a single trait, so only one, so yellow spot. Here, we face the same challenges when, when we use the gene bank the sources, but if we were to combine more than just one trait, how do we stack favorable alleles from multiple traits in the shortest possible time? So that means um, considering that parent selection is the key, whether we recycle these parents or we introduce new parents from exotic um, accessions, this is where genomic selection and speed breeding framework come into play. So um, by, by, by these um, tools, we can predict the performance of these lines by building up prediction models that allow us to identify individuals that will perform better and so are suitable as new parents for hybridization. So then we can select even those untested lines, meaning even not phenotype. Um, but we can do this as early as possible. So that means we can cut the short, the, the breeding cycle for, for, for when we use genomic selection, and we also cut the resource for phenotyping. So um, to not over, overly technical explanation of this genomic selection, this is just an overview of how genomic selection works. So the main feature here is that we have two sets of populations. First, we call them the training population, where all the, all the lines have been tested or phenotyped, and we know their DNA information. So they have both phenotype and genotype data. Second, there's the validation or the test population, where we only have their DNA information. So they, they have not been tested. Um, in genomic selection, we first use all the information from the training population to build a prediction model to calculate their genomic estimated breeding value. So then after, after calculating that, we now um, test how accurate the prediction models are by correlating their actual data versus the predicted breeding value. This predicted breeding value is basically just the sum of your marker effects. So I will not um, discuss this into detail, but to put it simply, we test if the prediction models are good or bad. If they are good, then we feed in the genomic information from this validation population. And then again, we calculate their estimated breeding value. 
And from this estimated breeding value, we then now can make selections. For example, which among, which from, among this validation population, which lines has the high breeding value? This means that even though these lines have not been tested, we can now already use them as a potential parent for crossing. So um, this is just one of the applications of genomic selection where it cuts the time and cost of field phenotyping early on in the breeding program. Um, but why do we care? So we all know that pathogens are constantly evolving, so overcoming genetic resistance. And we're not talking just one disease. Plants can be resistant to a specific disease, but susceptible to others, as you might remember from the table I showed earlier. So breeding for multiple disease resistance is, is really challenging. So the question is, how do we stack these group alleles? So if you look at the figure here, we have four lines or varieties, and each they carry good allele. If in this example, we cross one and two and three and four, we combine the allele. On the F1 stage, we, we have this um, population where, or line where they have a combined allele from both parents. But then if we stack them all together, then we, will, we would have to do another series of crossings. So in the end, you'll end up with all four alleles in all combinations. So this looks manageable because we only have four parents, only one offspring of each cross, and only one stage of intercrossing. But in reality, in most commercial breeding program, the normal size of the base parents is 50. So these 50 are already the ones that are good. And if you were to stack all good alleles, you would cross them with all possible combination, you would end up with 12,250 lines. But you would have to do several stages of intercrossing to stack all the uh, alleles from the 50 parents. So the number would grow exponentially. And it's really impossible considering all the effort and the crossing time, the space, and cost. So then this is basically what inspires us to come up with this fast stack approach. So illustrated in this simplistic chromosome figure where we stack all the favorable chromosome segments and create this new set of germplasm carrying these um, combinations. In order to do this fast stack approach, we are combining different applications of genomic selection to build chromosome segments, um, genetic algorithm through AI, for selecting the best parents and the speed breeding to, to advance the generation very quickly. Um, but just to illustrate the theory in simple terms, how we define the chromosome segment. So this is the extension of genomic selection. So imagine this is the chromosome with only 30 SNPs or markers. First, we calculate the effect of individual SNPs on a particular trait, for example, resistance. And as I said, this is the extension of genomic selection because we account for all the marker effects. Um, and then second, we define the chromosome segments based on their linkage disequilibrium. So again, um, this is statistically how closely tied the markers are, meaning in theory, they can be passed on to the next generation because they are not easily subjected to recombinations. And we call these chromosome segments the blocks. You can see in this purple um, colors. And each block can contain either one or more markers. And then lastly, we sum up all the SNP effects and then we calculate their variance. So then the blocks with the highest variance now means that the, this block is associated with a trait of interest. And then we can determine which lines carry these good blocks. Um, and now that we have identified these chromosome blocks, where does this um, AI or the genetic algorithm come into play? So just a little background, this um, artificial intelligence framework that we're using follows the genetic algorithm principle. So as you all know, this is based on the theory of natural evolution by Charles Darwin. And this is popularly called the survival of the fittest. And this involves the size of the population, the fitness, meaning is basically the ability to reproduce, 
um, selection of mating partners, whether they're compatible or not, recombination, where there's the exchange of genetic materials between the parents through crossover, and most importantly, these um, random mutations. I specifically say random because um, this is how natural selection actually happens through randomized approach. And so by definition, genetic algorithm can help us solve complex problem. In our case, how we stack multiple disease traits to give an optimum result, which is the best selected uh, parents for crossing. So how does this artificial intelligence work? So this is highly computational and written in a oh, computer. I can't hear anything, Danny. <laughs> Sorry. OK. okay. <laughs> so this is um, basically a computer, um, how do you say that, highly computational um, tool. So what is that? What, what this AI does is that we tell the computer we have 50 parents. Then we input all the files, the, the DNA information and everything. So the computer then will make crosses and generates offspring. After the first generation, the offspring will um, are crossed again with each other and then generates the new offspring. The main feature here though is that this AI progressively selects the best crossing combinations of parents. So for example, when at the fifth generation, the best possible combination is not optimum. So then the computer will stop and start again from the beginning. So it basically learns that that particular crossing combination is not good. So the computer then will make new crossing selections until it reaches the desired result. And so this is how it progressively select better crossing combinations of lines to maximize favorable alleles. And through this um, computational approach, we can run for up to even 1,000 generations, which is unrealistic. But it just gets to show the computing power of this AI to give this um, what, we, what we want. And so this really helps us make targeted crossing. Um, so then to put this in practice or in real life, in partnership with the Long Reach, which is a breeding company in Australia, they provided us with this massive data sets. And currently we are working with 34,000 breeding lines that have been genotyped. And some of them have been tested across growing regions in Australia. So we just call them the macro regions. Um, they've been tested for traits such as yield, quality parameters and diseases. And in the disease data, we're actually working on nine different diseases. And what you see in this figure is just the population structure. So how genetically diverse the wheat lines are, um, where each dot represents an individual breeding line. What's um, unique in this data though, is that the lines are actually breeding lines. So that means they, they have, all, have all the pedigree information as compared to the exotic lines where some of them we don't know any information at all. So um, from these lines, if we select those best performing lines, we found that they are clustered together. So colored in red and maroon, just to represent the two types of growing regions where these lines are growing. So this is actually the current practice of selection where you cross good by good. Um, on the other hand, the blue and sky blue colors represent those lines that are selected by the AI using this genetic algorithm. So it is important to note here that these lines, although they carry the good alleles, they may not necessarily be the top performing lines. So what other message can we get from here? Um, so in the good by good strategy, because they are clustered um, together, you can basically exhaust their genetic diversity very early on. So that's a trade off. On the other hand, using these AI selected lines for crossing, they are scattered, meaning they are more genetically diverse and not clustered. So you are not losing the genetic diversity on your um, program.
Um, just to show you where we are now, this figure on top left is just to illustrate how the AI performed this targeted crossing that we've simulated. So the small, this is small squares, different colors, just to represent different individual parents. And what you're seeing on the right panel is the actual population that we've developed, currently growing under speed breeding here at YouTube. And as part of our population development in the glass house, we are also screening them for diseases. So uh, like uh, traditional pre-breeding um, selection. So now the plan is to advance the population for another two generations this year before we send them to our collaborators for um, field testing. And what's exciting here is using this speed breeding plus AI plus GS, we were able to develop a population F4 in just two years. So now from previous slide, you saw that those are just examples of how we use modern germplasm. Specific, specifically breeding lines from a commercial breeding company. But as part of the project, we are also extending this AI pipeline for use in exotic germplasm, in particular, in specifically here in barley. So here, our objective is to increase the genetic diversity of our modern barley to three main foliar diseases in Australia. So um, at this stage, we are currently halfway building a large exotic barley diversity panel. So at the moment, we have different collections from USDA, Asian, Spanish, Babelov, Ethiopian, and um, plus this barley mapping population developed for resistance to rust disease. Um, what you see on the figure on top is just an example of how the spike diversity of barley is from different colors, from golden yellow to black. And this map just shows the geographic origin of some of the barley accessions from the USDA collection. And they are color coded according to their um, different growth types. So then just to give you another preview, this is just the genetic diversity of some of the accessions that we have already been genotyped. So those that, that we have um, data. And just by looking at it, it's clear that there's a lot of diversity present here. In fact, the green cluster that you see in this um, panel figures, they are the Asian collection. The purple cluster is the Spanish collection and those other colors in orange, pink and yellow green are from European and Russian origins. Um, we are actually still in a very early stage uh, with this project and our next step is to build a database or haplotype information, meaning a catalog of where in the barley chromosomes the resistance factors are located. And then we will then use this information to feed into AI to help us select the best exotic parents that we can be, that can be used as parents in, in crossing. So just to summarize, we, we use this AI to assist in our breeding strategy, especially when dealing with multiple and complex traits where conventional selection is challenging. The AI-based selection strategy is based on building genotypes with favorable chromosome segments. And using this advanced rapid cycling by speed breeding and other breeding tools, we're able to develop breed populations that are expected to improve the genetic gain. Um, we are also now building a large panel of exotic barley germplasm and use the similar approach to increase their genetic diversity. And overall, we recognize this, um, the importance of these um, gene banks, especially the genetic diversity in crops. And our strategy is, is to create this improved germplasm with the ultimate targeted stack. And to end my talk, um, plant diseases and other constraints remain a great challenge. And to achieve the great, uh, the, the crop's genetic potential, we need to integrate the available breeding technologies. And breeding for disease resistance also face the same challenges, the need for speed. But also we recognize that um, genetic diversity is very important. Gene bank collections play an important role as sources of um, new genetic factors. And with that, maraming salamat po sa pakikinig.
thank you for your attention. And I would also like to acknowledge our collaborators and funding partners and members of the group. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sir Eric, uh, for that very comprehensive and very inspiring and Ba, nakaka, nakakamangha. <laughs> nakakamangha na ginagawa nyo pala dyan sa University of Queensland. Um, okay. So, um, probably I'll just throw in the first question. Uh, siguro wala kasi ako doon sa room. Lumabas ako saglit. Pero the, the Vabilov collection, uh, precisely, I mean, I, I, I've heard na parang nag-scatter siya after the war uh, because Russian si, ano, di ba, si Vabilov. And then I think... Yeah. Um, He's a Russian agronomist, botanist, and then he has a marami siyang collection, mm -hmm. pero na-scatter siya. And precisely, saan yung materials na ginagamit nyo ngayon? Saan yung siya nakuha? So we have, actually, some of the accessions that we have now are imported from, originally from Russia. But mm -hmm. we have this Australian Grains Gene Bank, where um, we have this, that's the main um gene bank collection in Australia. So those 300 lines are basically already here in Australia. That's why we yes. only managed to use 300. So okay. we acquired them from Australian Grains Gene Bank, but originally they were imported from Russia. From the Vavilov um, collection. From the Vavilov collection. Right. Okay. Yeah. So these are just cereals, right? Or do they have uh, other, other kinds they, of uh, commercial crops? Yes, in the Babel of Collection holds a lot of um, crops, so potato, barley, sorghum, mm. um, wheat. But in, in our project, we are basically working on cereal crops. So we have wheat, babylon, and then a barley babylon. Ah, I see. How about yeah. uh, uh, your project also accessing the, uh, what you call it, sal uh, the one in Norway, the Doomsday Vault? Uh, no. Uh, no. No, no, we okay. don't have that accession. I'm, I'm not too sure if they actually have that in Australian grains. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but we were just unfortunate to have access to the Vavilov collection. But yeah, it would be really interesting because yeah. in the new barley project, we have barley from USDA, barley from Ethiopia, barley from Spain, barley from Asian collection. So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how, how far we could go though. Yeah, it would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Because Iri, I think it's... Uh, Providing uh, some of its collections to the Doomsday yeah. Vault, okay. And yes. I don't, I don't know about uh, if the Australian government is also contributing to that uh, to that uh, gene bank. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too familiar how the gene bank works here in Australia because the resource that we have is actually not like the, we're not li literally partnering with them. We just use yes. their accession, so right. um, I'm not too sure about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. So there, there's a question from Maria Franz uh, de Vergara. So her question is: Aside from NCBI or GenBank, what are the other available protein databases uh, that can be easily or freely accessed uh, in the internet? Do you have any? So for plant species, we basically use Ensemble. If you've heard about the Ensemble um, database, Ensemble. so a lot, yes, a lot of our, research, our resources are from there, um, specifically in, in wheat and barley, because the, the genome are basically published or um, uploaded there, compared to NCBI, where majority they are mostly human genes and other eukaryotic um, species. Mm -hmm. But for crops, we, yeah, we use Ensemble. Okay. Is it free? Um, Is that database free? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, the good thing though, you can you can make your account and then every time you submit a job or every time you use that, you can just you save it on your on your account. But it's it's free. But you can also contribute to that. Uh, you yes. can contribute sequences to that. Uh, to um, that I'm, not too I'm not too sure. I think you have to, to contact those developers though, because I this see. is um, a collaborator a collaboration between different <clears throat> projects um, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I yeah. see. So uh, uh, from Roden Carlo Lizardo, uh, he asks, are there any trade-off or trade-offs or undesirable effects when stacking uh, multiple resistance genes on wheat? Um, so in, in simulation, we don't see that one, but it's, it would be inter interesting to see how they actually perform in the field. So that's really the, 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 what we're aiming for so that um, 
when in the field, we won't or we shouldn't be expecting any trade-off because all the data that we put in include yield data, disease data, so everything will be in there. But yeah, you're right. It's really interesting to see what's um, the actual performance in real life because some of these are also just um, using the computer program. So it's in, in yeah. silico, basically, in simulation. So it might not work. It might, it might work. So we, we, yes. Of course, you, you should have uh, some sort of you know, a series of trials like what, yes. what we do here in the Philippines. I don't know if it's still, uh, it's also the practice in in Australia, but we have these uh, regional and national yes. cooperative trials uh, yes. before any, you know, any uh, commercial can right. be released. Yeah, okay. so in Australia, they call it national variety testing. So mm -hmm. there's a series of testing in different growing regions in different years before you can actually release a product. So, um, Miss Elsie Cacho says, uh, Sir, your crossbreeding selection on wheat, uh, is it also applicable to common vegetables? Um, is your crossbreeding selection technique on, on wheat? Yes. Is it, it also be, applicable to common vegetables? The principle should be applicable to any crop species because the principle behind in selecting the parents should be um, similar across all species. For example, that's why now we're using barley to apply the similar pipeline. So this um, crossing strategy was first developed on wheat, but we're using this on barley now. But essentially all this crossing strategy, depending on your program, it should be the same. I see, okay. So Roden Lizardo comments, um, just a side comment. Uh, it is very impressive that uh, knowing that we are still in the idea of marker assisted selection for breeding while uh, I think it's here in the Philippines, we're still doing marker assisted selection for breeding while uh, at your uh, institute, uh, you're already using AI. So um, do you know of any other uh, institutes or countries or uh, improvement um, programs that are also using uh, AI right now? Not the AI, but genomic selections already been um, implemented or being applied or being used in different countries, different universities, different breeding companies. So um, marker assisted selection though is good if your trade, uh, you're dealing with qualitative or like few genes or single genes because you're talking about few markers. But genomic selection though is for complex traits where you can't just use a single marker. So that's why it's all, all the performance or the effect of, the, of that um, in a particular trait. So then, yeah, genomic selection, but for AI, I think we're quite unique in that, in that sense because um, we don't know from other institutes actually using AI. I think this is new for us. Um, yeah. Yes, because this is extension of the genomic selection framework. A lot of people define their chromosome segments um, just by selecting the entire chromosome. But here we just use the blocks of segments and then just feed that to AI to select. Because traditionally, you can just select based on the performance. But for us, because we deal with complex traits, we want to make sure to um, make a targeted crossing but in, in, in such a way that we do that effectively. And how we do that is using this um, artificial intelligence. And actually this is um, done or this predictions done on different um, fields as well. We just, in, in crops, actually we are behind behind on that. A lot Sorry. of um, like human mm -hmm. studies, animal yeah. studies, they do this in genomic selections and stuff. But uh, in crops, we are behind um, on that one. And uh, we're just applying these techniques in crops. Okay. Um, probably, ano lang, parang question lang. Is, uh, since kumagamit na kayo ng AI, uh, can I know or is it possible to know if um, Australia has already released any uh, commercial, uh, commercial product using AI uh, that involved the use of AI in the selection? No. Okay. We're actually the first one. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. So in how many years would you do you think that uh, you will be able to release your first uh, 
commercial product on so, wheat? So what happens currently, we are aiming to provide the seeds that we develop in the grasshouse. So that's the pre-breeding aspect. We're aiming to send this this year, those seeds, mm -hmm. the population that we developed. And then from there, it will still go into different and um, field trials, extensive. So I don't know how long it would still take, maybe five years. So it's still a long, long way for us to be able to release an actual um, product, like but an actual variety. Yeah. But, but at least, at least you're probably around 50, 50 yeah. 60 percent of, uh, of the way. Okay. So the good thing, okay. The good thing though Continue. is we, we we cut the length of pre-breeding. So we develop or. Um, this population already in F4 for two years. Normally, if you would do it in normal glasshouse, it's probably be double mm -hmm. because you can only grow two yes. generations per year. So yeah, you're speed breeding. Because speed. Of okay. Yes, but still, you still have to test this in the field. Mm -hmm. So from Darwin, Landicho, how do gene banks ensure that the exotic or quarantine pests or diseases are not spread through germplasm trade? So do you have yeah, any so like protocols or biosafety measures on that? The gene banks that we use are actually already here in Australia. So we don't need to acquire any import or quarantine measures from other countries for, for us to be able to use this. So what we use here are those collections that are already available or already um, acquired in Australia. So as I mentioned, it's the Australian Grains Gene Bank Collections. So they hold their own um, gene bank collections. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too familiar with how they, they acquire their permits though, but you're right. So these are for sure, they already have their own um, protocol, especially in Australia, that even just when you bring plants, your own, when you, for example, me, when I travel to the Philippines, even just bringing good foods, like foods, the strict, mm -hmm. the quarantine here is very strict. Very strict. So imagine about this um, collections, gene banks. So for yeah. sure they will have strict um, uh, regulations as well. Of course. Uh, from Justin Christian Mulig, uh, he asks, are there different biotypes of yellow rust in wheat? Does your identified QTL uh, address multiple resistance? Did you also consider gene pyramiding of multiple QTLs with significant effects? Yeah, so in Australia, we found that some of the resistance genes that already um, are available, they are not effective now on some of the um, phenotypes or the strains of wheat because they overcome it. So that's why in, in most of the breeding company, they do stacking, pyramiding of wheat. There's actually the CSI road, they, they work heavily on rust. They clone the genes and then they stack them together. Yes, because some of the genes, especially now, even like two years ago, I think some of the collections, some of the rust strains that my colleagues have been working, the, the cultivars are now are not resistant anymore because of that new type of rust. So you lose that effectivity. And yeah, stacking is one of the, is the or I mean, pyramiding is, is one of the um, strategies, but that's effective if you know or clone the gene that you're, you're, you're aiming for. But in, in, in most cases, some of these genes are not cloned yet. For example, in yellow spot, we don't know or we haven't cloned that one yet. We just identify. We just know that they are, there are genes available. But we want to use that as soon as possible. So instead of waiting to clone them, and it will take years still, so we just introgress them. But yeah, um, if you're dealing with multiple uh, single genes, good pyramiding or pyramiding is okay or, or is good strategy. Especially, I think now they have five stacked genes already in place because they've already cloned. Mm -hmm. okay. So from Dave General, um, uh, this is a related question. Uh, would Australia's plant quarantine rules prevent you from importing promising germplasm from Vavilov or other collections? Um, so I can't say, um, I don't have any complete answer to that because mm -hmm. again, um, all the collections that we use are already present here in Australia. So we all don't right. need to deal them from importing to other countries. Um, yeah, but for sure they will 
probably prevent you, especially if those accessions are from um, countries where there's a lot of disease going on, especially um, safe or clean sources are to be imported here in Australia. So do you have any more questions from the audience? Any live questions? Okay. Uh, grab your chance to talk with uh, Dr. Ding Lasan regarding uh, these uh, technologies and uh, techniques that they are using in Australia, uh, using exotic, uh, what do you call this, uh, properties from exotic <laughs> collections. Like, no. Actually, my, uh, it's very admirable because I think uh, in field rice, I, they, they had a project back then, you know, collecting heirloom rice. And then I don't know if they were able to get uh, anything from there, like uh, you know, the traits. Maybe, siguro yung ano lang, uh, relatively, di naman ganun ka high tech, right? But uh, parang uh, wala akong narinig, narinig pang balita if uh, these, uh, the disease resistance, the, the other traits and qualities from our heirloom rice in probably in Ifugao, in the Cordilleras, are already, um, uh, what do you call this, um, uh, put inside our, our new commercial mm -hmm. breeds. Uh, kasi parang very lately, ang, parang ang naging um, um, trust ay towards hybridization or getting hybrids from, I think, from China. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it really depends on the objective. Because if you already have that source of trait or genes in your modern um, collection, then it's a lot easier to manipulate, it's a lot easier to handle, rather than going back to an exotic germplasm. Mm -hmm. I think I think so. Yeah, this is just different uh, strategy because some of the traits that we are um, working on, some of them or the modern um, cultivars that we have now, they don't have that trait. So, but hybridization, yeah, it's, it's, it really depends on what you are aiming for. Yeah. Uh, the thing that they want is uh, uh, like high producing, like uh, yes. producing a, a good tonnage. But uh, there, are, there are traits and characteristics that are now offset. Like uh, mm -hmm. some say that uh, they're easily stunted or the yeah. rice grains are are shattering yes. ba, or they have very poor post-harvest quality but of course that's uh that's the challenge for our, our breeders and our yeah. agronomists <laughs> and of course our geneticists and uh, other um scientists as well to to you know to come up with a very good plan and a very good uh, uh yeah. interdisciplinary program to you know uh, yes. To ensure that uh, we have uh, sufficient uh, food, uh, not only for rice, but other staples as well. Yeah, that's right. Because that's why I mentioned earlier the difference between the actual breeding line and the exotic line. Because in the breeding line, you already have their pedigree information. So they are all coming from what we have now. So they are all part of a breeding pipeline. So they are just selected. Oh, some of them will be actually the winners. So they're already there. In compared to if you are going to use exotic germplasm, so there's a lot or a series of yeah. steps still. So in rice, yeah, maybe there's just um, they already have that in place. Or I'm not too familiar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, so we have no more questions in the chat box, and so probably uh, it's time to move on. And uh, on behalf of our director, Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, uh, we are thanking you, Sir Eric, for taking time off from your work yeah, sure. and uh, joining us here in the Philippines uh, to share with you, uh, to share with us um, these interesting uh, you know, techniques and uh, developments uh, in Australia with regards to you know, using uh, those exotic collections, you know, gene banks, um, uh, to. You know, to help develop your uh, food crops okay so with that uh that we will just present you a virtual certificate of uh, recognition <laughs> it's uh, one of our traditions here so let me just uh share my screen all right so um maraming salamat po uh on behalf of the 
director at the Museum of Natural History uh, awards the certificate of recognition to Dr. Eric G. Dinglasan for serving as our resource person uh, during the 2021 MNH Biodiversity Series uh, seminar entitled Fantastic Genes and Where to Find Them, the Role of Gene Banks, uh, Sources of uh, in the Rapid Discovery and Use of Novel Disease Resistance in Crops, held uh, today, February 17, from 1 to 2.30 uh, p.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. So in witness whereof, the director's signature is affixed here. And uh, maraming salamat po sa inyo, Sir Eric, for, uh, for, having being, me. A, for being our resource, resource person today. Okay. And before we end our program, we will be uh, providing out the link to the evaluation form later once I finish with this uh, PowerPoint presentation. But if you are familiar with Bitly, you could go to uh, bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval. Okay. We will accept responses until 11.30 p.m. tonight, Philippine time. So uh, we are inviting you to go over um, and uh, check our website at mnh.uplb.edu.ph. Uh, if you have any other questions or uh, comments, you could email us at mnh.uplb.edu.ph. We are also um, you know, everywhere in social media, so you could look for us in uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. We also have entries in Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. <laughs> so uh, for anyone who wish to uh, review the, the talk of Dr. Ding Lasan later, uh, probably uh, in a few hours or tomorrow morning, Philippine time, we will be posting the recording over at our YouTube channel. So go to face uh, youtube.com slash UPLB Museum. All right.